Hello everyone, uh, welcome. Uh, we were waiting for the 80 people that had signed up to this meeting to turn up, but I think <laughs> we can't wait all day and thank you very much for coming. We've got some really exciting talks and we've got some people who have come all the way down to Gla from Glasgow to, uh, to talk. So welcome to the uh, this session on severe malnutrition it, um, and it's not just about the calories as you'll see. Um, there's some, I just wanted to remind people what these uh, the IGHI um, Global Health Forums are for. They're, they're, the idea is to bring uh, to uh, um, operate as a platform to bring together imperial researchers, students, and staff from across the, um, the actual imperial's faculties to highlight and discuss and disseminate uh, research findings and innovations that, that are relevant to uh, global health. Um, they take place on a Thursday at this time, at, sometimes at a different locations, um, at once a month. Um, we will be tweeting um, live during the event. Um, no, no, no I, well, I might be tweeting about you, Gary. <laughs> um, and with our hashtag is uh, hashtag IGF Forum, and our Twitter handle is at Imperial IGH. So I'm going to start by introducing um, all of the speakers, um, and then I'm going to hand over to Gary. And so my, the first speaker I'm going to introduce is myself, because I'm going to give you a bit of the background to this uh, work. So um, I'm well, I'll sort of talk about myself a little bit. I've been uh, with Imperial College um, since uh, 2000 and, no, no, 1998. Um, but I've spent the vast majority of those years uh, since 2000 um, based in East Africa in Kenya. And so I'm one of Imperial College's best kept secrets. And so I've come to talk about, I, I actually focus on critical care, but actually as you'll see from some of the, uh, some of the slides that I'll show you, that actually that, that spectrum includes children with severe malnutrition. End of slideshow. Where do I find mine? need a bit of help to oh it's there it's this one here yeah it's the usual one right so when we look at global bird of disease you, one often is presented um, in sort of uh, uh, white documents or uh, things that, that they talk about the sort of diseases that c kill children under five and and what you'll see from all of this is they they, they stratify children according to sort of syndromic uh, conditions, diarrhea, respiratory, neonatal deaths, um, <coughs> malaria, but what you don't see in that, that often in that, uh, that sort of mapping of what's the, what the global burden of disease is malnutrition. Um, this was picked up on by the Lancet, and so in 2008 they had their first um, maternal and uh, child um, and nutrition series, um, and then uh, in 2013, they realised that this is very much needed updating. So once again, they had a whole series of, uh, uh, pa uh, uh, of uh, um, um, papers by really eminent people in the field, and they're, they're very, very much worth reading. One that's slightly dropped off the, it is by our own David Nabaru, but he's, it, I think he's fell off the bottom of the screen, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyhow, so it's, it is a very important... Uh, um, uh, uh, condition and it's, it's, it's said to oh, undernutrition is set, uh, said to affect up to a million children in the developing world and that's mainly in Asia and, and, and Africa. It's also implicated in 45% of the uh, global child mortality, maybe not as a necessary as a presenting condition but as a comorbidity. Um, and uh, uh, one just thinks about well it's just isn't it just about feeding well that's not what it is about. Its etiology is complex and multifactorial. So this is what I talk about, the many faces of severe malnutrition. This is the one that you might think of what you recognise as a very, very thin child. He's presented as, um, a, a, in a health facility. He, he probably doesn't need hospitalisation. But as you see from the, all of the other pictures, and, and this, this is talks to my speciality, severe critical illness. Many children who present to health facilities come in with life-threatening conditions, um, largely uh, due to uh, co-infections, co-infe as well as on top of their very, very poor nutritional status. In fact... 
we've, we estimated from the data from Khalifi, which is I'm based on the coast in Khalifi, um, we've got a surveillance uh, that's been going on for, uh, since the last 27 years, and we're able to largely sort of describe what we see in children with severe malnutrition. And those who are just to get admitted to hospital with just malnutrition alone, without any other co uh, complications, is only about a quarter. Whereas you see that all of the, um, the, the children who all present, 75% will have another condition, either um, a pneumonia or diarrhea, or come in with profound septic shock. We see very early uh, uh, mortality um, in, in the first two days. and. Uh, um, uh, th this curve has probably slightly shifted because we've got slightly better at meet treating them, but actually we haven't really brought, brought down overall mortality in the last 25 years that we've been um, addressing this. Um, and there's one of the areas that I, I have been investigating, a lot of people think that this early mortality is because children who have severe malnutrition and you start to feed them, they might die of the, uh, uh, quite early on of refeeding syndrome, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a minute. But also, there's always been a concern about the malnourished heart, um, and whether this, is, this may have um, caused the sudden and unexpected deaths in the first, uh, uh, first day. And these are the, many of the things that uh, are written in the guidelines. There's extensive uh, uh, paragraphs in some of the treatment guidelines suggesting that the heart is shrunk and it's, you, can't, you should not give intravenous fluids to these children because they can't cope with the, vo with the fluid volume because they're, they've got incipient risk of heart failure, but also they can't cope with the sodium overload. If you could then go try and find that literature supporting some of this, it's very, very, well, it has been till recently fairly wafer thin. And so children who have, who have diarrhea, they get very dehydrated. And what you would normally give to children who are very dehydrated um, when they're too sick to be, be able to drink is intravenous fluids. But these children are largely denied that because everybody fears putting them into heart failure. It doesn't matter if they die of their diarrhea, it's just you haven't you put them into heart failure. The group with Kwashiorkor, which is this edematous, uh, uh, um, uh, what used to be called protein energy malnutrition, that's the one that they feel is, is particularly at risk. And it's been described in other populations when you uh, rapidly feed somebody who's very, very, de uh, very, very malnourished. Uh, the concern is that they develop arrhythmias. So we have actually looked at, you know, whether these early deaths and, and some of the deaths in hospitals are due to um, uh, are due to cardiac dysfunction. And just I know we're meant to be talking about the gut, but I just it's a, it's one body, and I just wanted to say a little bit about this study because it's 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 a the largest and uh, the most comprehensive study using multiple different parameters, and it's a case control study. The controls are matched to the, the, it's, um, for severity. In other words, if we had a child came in with pneumonia, with um, malnutrition and pneumonia, would um, would match them to another pneumonia admission that wasn't. Um, and so this allowed us to actually see whether actually the changes that you see in the, the, the heart function are due to the underlying conditions or are due to severe malnutrition. As I said, it was um, a multi-parameter. We, we did it over a period of 28 days. And we did halter monitoring for, for the first seven days on a, on a number of children. And we recorded many, many hours. We did this in cases and also controls of continuous e e ECG um, monitoring. This will allow us to pick up if they, if you get refeeding, so you, it's hypothesized that you, you develop an arrhythmia and which can cause um, a, a, a sudden death. Yes, we saw some, um, some changes in the heart rhythm, but these were not associated with any clinical events. So we really kind of uh, sort of bust that myth that some of these early events are due to a refeeding syndrome. We saw that some of the changes that we saw in the electrical rhythm, the ECG, they, they normalized as the, as the potassium and uh, all the other conditions <coughs> came, came back. So we also were able, to, we did give children um, intravenous rehydration and we found that they actually had a normal response, a, a response that you'd expect in a normal, well-nourished child and it, an, an appropriate response. And so we didn't see any fluid overload events, which was very reassuring. 
So this paper is about to come out. I'm going to be tweeting about this next week. It's, uh, where it's, a, it's a, an enormous undertaking, um, and uh, we're very pleased that this, this is being published. And really the conclusion is the malnourished heart is not at risk of heart failure, as everybody has worried for decades and decades, and we should not be denying these children um, uh, uh, intravenous foods. But obviously, to take that forward, you'll have to do the trials, which is what we're going to be doing in the next year or so. We've got funding for that. So it takes us back to, well, if they're not dying of, 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 of uh, cardiac problems, what are they dying of? Well, we know that diarrhea is a, a, a occurs in many children who have severe malnutrition. And it was, it's considered in the guidelines to be, yes, it's there, but it's re largely irrelevant and don't, don't over-respond to it well. It's, we don't think it is. So not only do you have children who are admitted with diarrhea, once you start to give them feeds, quite a lot develop quite a severe, almost like an osmotic diarrhea, it almost looks like cholera. And so they, you know, they're not, they're not res responding appropriately to their, their, their nutritional feeds. We find compared to children who have any diarrhea, you have a much, much higher mortality than children who don't. So this is obviously underpinning s some of the deaths. Um, th what are the key risk factors? Well, bacteremia, which is mainly um, uh, largely gram negative and obviously any signs of dehydration which is obviously the consequence so we're beginning to think right there's something wrong with the gut barrier because uh, and it's it's letting in it's it letting in bacteremia and it's also having a major impact on on the, the children's outcome sorry it's a, a repeat slide and i think it's it's just to show that actually this this is not of trivial consequence. Um, they, it's said that uh, the signs of dehydration are totally unreliable in children with malnutrition. You can't you can't differentiate. They can't differentiate sick children from not. That's that's clearly not um, um, demonstrated by this. That if you have signs of dehydration and if you have signs of shock, you have a phenomenally high case fatality. Once again, talking to about whether we're giving the right treatment or you know withholding treatment. But the, you know, this is very significant. I can't believe that this. This really, what I was trying to show is, you know, what are the risk factors for poor outcome? And I just want to sh uh, highlight the the fact that dehy the dehydration signs, but also bacteremia is one of the key uh, risk factors for poor outcome. We witness poor outcome in hospital, but we also once we think that the ch children have repaired and we're sending them home, this is a graph from one of my colleagues, um, J um, Jay Barclay, just showing that actually the mortality over days after admission, it continues. So you might fix the child, and this is according to, um, 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 but actually you've, there's something clearly gone wrong. And, um, and so you, you think you've got to think about the long term and, and treatments for, that will influence the long term. And this is really just an introduction to what the rest of uh, my speakers, uh, because people are now become, and it's and it's really a, there's a gathering interest in this, and this is really not not been highlighted as the main uh, um, issue in um, children with malnutrition until really the last uh, four or five years. So I'm going to hand over to Gary now to take us take on the next next challenge. <laughs> What you'll soon find in this talk is that I'm a very dangerous person. I know little bits about lots of things, but not very much about one thing in particular. <coughs> and I think the other thing is that we're not very good at saying thank you. And I think most of this today is down to a chance meeting with Kath about 10 years ago now at a conference. And it's Kath that's gone out of a way to facilitate most of this area over in Africa and we've kind of run some mad ideas on the back of her enthusi enthusiasm. So what you're about to see really is down to Kath with someone pretending to know what they're doing at the back of it really. <coughs> I, I hope that you find it challenging. The, the title is challenging and um, one thing that we're not saying is that, that energy is not important to these children. So again, as Kath said, that 
that wasting is still important. This is a really important message at the present time because there's been a switch. People are getting very worried about non-communicable diseases in, in low to middle income countries. And the worry is that the, un whoops, oh gosh, it's on its time. The, un the undernutrition part is falling off the edge of people's scope. And it's still there, and it's still there in big numbers. And we still haven't got an answer to an awful lot of it. So this is a plea really to not forget that this is a import, really important er, 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 area. And I hope what we'll pull out over the next six or seven slides is that, yes, nutritional rehabilitation is very important. So the traditional nutritional rehabilitation is, is very important. And products like these and this have done amazingly well, particularly for children who have uncomplicated severe malnutrition. But as Kath just highlighted, the children with complicated severe malnutrition, we've not shifted very much at the present time. So don't get me wrong, these are very important things and they've saved thousands and upon thousands of children's lives. But they've hidden a problem, that problem of mortality that goes on and on and <coughs> on and on after a child has been uh, admitted with severe, complicated un 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 undernutrition. Oops. So we know that it accounts uh, for a lot of deaths. There's been improvement, but there's been little progress made, which is what Kath hi 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 highlighted just, just before. And um, what we would argue, one of the organs that's not been looked at very well and has been terribly ignored is the gut and the role of the gut in undernutrition. Because again, as, as I will say, and perhaps some of the other speakers will bring forward as well, is that there are severe changes in the gut and the way that the gut handles nu 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 nutrients, its integrity itself. So you heard that there are problems with septicemia. Many of those bugs that cause septicemia are gut-based. So the, one of the questions we're asking, basically, is that can we get into this? Can we actually show a way to actually support the gut at this critical time when it's falling apart? And it, it's quite common, this. It doesn't matter. Even in well-nourished people who have a trauma, the gut will fall apart because you change blood flow. And as soon as you change blood flow, the gut starts to leak. Here you've got a double hit. You've got children that don't have any nutrients flowing through the gut, so the epithelial surface cannot feed itself, and you've got a trauma as well. So the, you've got a double hit there. Okay. And this is just, a, again, as I said, I'm quite a simple person. I like really simple diagrams. So what you've got, really, and I think it's quite, it's not, this isn't about severe malnutrition, but I think it demonstrates the point. You can count up here the kind of stresses that, that a child with severe malnutrition may have when they come into somewhere like Kath's unit. So they come in, they might have a pathogen infection, they might actually have some other stress, so they might have HIV, they might have malaria, for example. The actual changes in the gut may lead to lac lactose intolerance, again. And the, uh, one of the things that has been a real surprise to me, not to Kath, is the use of antibiotics and the, the, what the effect of the use of antibiotics on children admitted to hospital. It can't be got round, but the actual impact that they make on the gut health is absolutely enormous. So all of these stresses, what do they do? Well, they actually have an impact on the epithelial surface. They call an inflammatory response, and that inflammatory response causes a cascade throughout the gut where you lose your tight junction, and those tight junctions actually then start to leak, and they leak bacterial pro pro products into the bloodstream. So our, our, our kind of hypothesis is that can we get in and help fix that in children with severe malnutrition? And does that actually affect the mortality um, within, within the children? And he, 
he can say, well, you know, you've got a little bit of evidence that it might be very difficult. So this is Jeff Gordon's work. Uh, there's a few people from Imperial on this or not? I can't remember. So, so th what they're saying here is, is that one of the important things about the gut is the bugs that live there. Because the bugs that live there produce stuff that's important to the actual functioning of the gut. They produce things like short chain fatty acids, which are really important to the gut integrity. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But what they're saying is that if you actually have a, a bout of severe, um, severe mal, mal, malnutrition, these bugs change. The actual population of bugs change, and it changes per, per, permanently. So here you have a measure. This is a very simple measure of the diversity of the bugs in the gut. No more than that. So here's your actual healthy child. You'd expect that to be zero, and this is just a comparison to a healthy child, basically. And there's two sides of this. These are children that got their rescue formula, the F75 that you just saw a picture of, or a locally produced one here. And you can see that in both cases, the actual gut microbiota is, um, has a rel relative immaturity about it in those children who actually have severe malnutrition, which never ever comes back to the healthy child. So if the gut microbiota is producing molecules, which is important for the health of the gut, like short chain fatty acids, this is a major important ob ob observation. And they would say that the, in the paper that there are low levels of short chain fatty acids in these children. And it doesn't matter what you feed them. Now we're going to push that, we're going to question that uh, as, 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 as assumption as we go forward. This is data from a very small child. So uh, what you'll see next is a whole load of data that's not been seen other than by Kath and myself and a few other people in the audience. So you can take it as, as you want. But this is, um, this is actual work that was done in Kath's unit um, in Mbali mainly. Was, Uganda, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and basically this is a 16S. Um, so that's, this is a, a, a measure of the microbes in, 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 in the faeces of children with severe mal, malnutrition. The red dots are unfortunately the children that died uh, in the trial and the blue dots are the children that survived. So it shows exactly the same thing what Jeff Gordon showed, that there's a decreased diversity, but here we don't see any difference between the children that died and the children that survived <coughs> as far as the diversity measure goes. So that's, that's, that's an imp quite an important observation. So what is it that's going on? Well, it's a functioning, we would argue it's a functioning of the actual microbiome. There's a huge redundancy in the microbiome. So this, this is measurements again that was done by, um, by Dudless, who's sitting in the front row and we'll speak a little bit later on. Um, this is this is a, a sugar test, so you can understand how the gut leaks by giving them a number of sugars. This is a dual sugar test. It doesn't really matter what it does. Going up means your gut's leaking. Going down means the gut has more integrity. So in those children that survived, the gut didn't leak as much as those children that died. And again, PYY is a gut hormone. Okay, it's normally associated with appetite regulation. It's a bit false in normal physiology, perhaps, that. What it is important about is the regulation of the gut. It actually controls how the stomach empties and how peristalsis moves. And here again, what you see in the children that survived, there's a different level here. The actual higher, the higher PYY will slow down the motility of the gut itself. So despite the actual immaturity, the way that the microbiota is functioning is very, very different within these children. So the short chain fatty acids as well are very different. Okay, we'll skip through that. So and here you've got just a little list of, yeah? Forget about this side. I, what I want is just to focus on this bit here and this bit here. So, so the short chain fatty acids, there's mainly the three common ones. So there's acetate, that's the stuff you put on your chips when you're in vinegar. 
yeah, which is a, and then propionate and then butyrate. And they're the three ones. And they all play incredibly important roles in physiology. So butyrate in particular plays a role in gut integrity. It plays a role in stabilizing DNA within the actual enteric cell itself. Acetate is an important source of N, N energy. And if you look at the relationship between the microbial products and what they do, you can see that they're kind of important. So they're actual, they're normal gastrointestinal function, their immune function, they're responsible for that. Normal gut motility, they actually play a major role in that. So if you cut these out or they're low, then you've got problems. And the main source of these, the main source for these bugs is carbohydrate in the colon. Now normally, obviously in white bread and things like that, you don't get an awful lot of carbohydrate re reaching the colon. So it's, it's carbohydrate that's resistant to enzyme digestion, so resistant starch or dietary fibre. And the bugs can use that as an energy source and then they flourish and they bloom and that's incredibly important for lots of reasons. And they actually then start to produce this cascade, I'm not going to go through this, but the, the cascade of short chain fatty acids. So you need carbohydrate flowing into the colon to actually produce short chain fatty acids. So in undernourished kids that aren't eating, you haven't got that. Then if they're undernourished with a, a dysfunctioning gut, you've actually got a double hit on this. Okay? And the critically important thing down here, again I've put to remind me more than anything else, is that a number of these short chain fatty acids are important for secreting intestinal growth factors, such as glucagon like peptide two. Okay? So what we've got with those rescue feeds at the moment is feeds which are very highly absorbed. They're made deliberately to get into the child very quickly and efficiently. And they're absorbed way up the top of the gut and very little of it get, whoops, gets through to the bottom of the gut. So that what we've questioned is whether if we put something in there that actually gets through to the bottom of the gut, can we actually improve the gut function? Uh, for these children okay and what we've come come up with is the idea of using legumes to actually do this because legumes are a cheap commodity they're grown in very many low to middle income countries they're they're a common food there um, as I'll show you in a minute and they have a, an enormous resistant starch content and they're processed so they're, again this is some some pictures that are taken around in Bali. Yes, this is the when we were yeah. processing our feet. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> so 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 this is this is Mimble One, which you'll come across in the moment. <laughs> so so, but the point is that you can locally process these feeds. You can mill the actual beans down into a powder, which you can then actually add to feed some cells and see whether you actually can support the gastrointestinal tract. <laughs> So we undertook, or Kath and her team undertook, a study which we've now called MIMBLE, MIMBLE 1 and MIMBLE 2 is on the way at the moment, which is a really proof of concept study to understand whether we can actually supplement children's feeds with locally grown beans to actually improve gastrointestinal function by delivering more carbohydrate into the colon. Okay. So we've got, uh, in this study, which was done by a very fastidious uh, physician and was absolutely amazing, she did incredibly well. So we ended up with, this, as I said, a small randomised control trial with people randomised three ways onto F75, which is standard milk, or a supplement with in inulin. That's a normal dietary fibre product that's used in the UK for fermentation. So this delivers what we've done or a cow pea, which is a black-eyed pea, if people don't know what, what we're talking about. And again, we'll come back to talk about that, because there's, there's a bit of learning for, for, for me in this. Really. Okay. So the first thing that we can say at the end of this is, is that legumin-enriched feeds <coughs> in very sick children, when they're first admitted to hospital, so these children were randomised on admission, to hospital with complex SAM, not, not just simple SAM, but complex SAM are well tolerated. 
So, the, so that's a good thing. So children didn't get diarrhea or anything like that. Okay. Surprisingly, what we didn't see, which we wanted to really, is that these are, again, this is the gut bugs, the actual 16S, looking at two different ways of expressing the actual diversity. This is F75, S75 with the dietary fibre, the inulin, F75 with the cowpea uh, flour. You can see that there was very little difference between them. So again, you could argue, well, but a little bit disappointing perhaps. So again, this is day admission, sorry, day seven and, um, and, and day 28. What I'd like you to look at though, just out of interest, is that this decline in diversity here from one to seven days is enormous and that's probably driven by the complexity of the disease and the use of antibiotics. <laughs> <laughs> the use of antibiotics. So, uh, so the, the treatment actually works against us here. So anything I've got to do has got to try and get around that. So we've got a simplified... So did, in the background of that, did anything ha happen in this case? Well, <coughs> yes. So again, this is, this is the actual <laughs> same thing, giving the, the sugar test. Here we've just expressed it as, as lactulose here. And again, what you'd see, so this is a control, day one, day seven, day 28. And you can see that the actual deterioration over that period of time when the antibiotics are going. So the gut begins to leak even more. Yeah? And it takes a long time to come back. Yeah? You have a little bit of improvement here for the actual uh, uh, um, uh, inulin supplemented feed. But amazingly what's happened is that it seems that the actual pea flour has stabilised the gut. So despite the antibiotics, despite the, the fact that the microbiota remains simple, the, the actual chickpeas seem to actually flatten the deterioration in the gut function or the gut integrity, gut barrier. Do, do, Douglas will tell me off for using the wrong word, I know. Okay. And these are the short chain fatty acids. Quite a complicated graph, but just what I want you to do is just to keep an eye on these, this decline here. So this decline from day one to day seven. Yeah, so the acetate, propionate and butyrate. This is the standard feed, okay. Little movements at the end here as the children actually get better perhaps. Um, and this is the cowpea. I haven't shown you the inulin because I thought it, 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 it doesn't really do much different from the actual standard feed. But you can see again here that we've stopped that decline between day one and day seven. So despite the, the microbiota remains simple, we've actually stopped the decline in short chain fatty acids and we've got to improve barrier function. So again, for a small pilot study, it's giving us information which is far exceeds its actual power, really. So what we've gone on and done now is that we've actually uh, taken it to one step further. So this is Mimble 2 here. This is the actual, we've gone posh. We've actually got the actual feed canned this time rather than getting the nurses to make it up on the ward. Um, and there's a huge randomised control trial now going on in the two units in Kenya and Uganda. Um, so we're up to about 105 people. 115. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, that is ongoing at, at the present time. Okay. And if you're interested in looking at some of the things that spun out of that, we were lucky enough to get a... Uh, beginning a, a, a Pathfinder grant from the MRC to actually put this work into place in, in uh, East Africa and in, 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 in India and that's produced a white paper that goes through some of the concepts that we've just mentioned just now and we've produced a little model that goes through what exactly what we're saying so what we're talking about is not just simple SAM. Simple SAM I think is fixed to some extent it's a more complicated the one, the children coming in with complex conditions that we've got problems with. And how do we actually support the things that have gone wrong? We think that we might have an insight into a solution. One thing I 
will say that we haven't haven't shown you there is that that inulin that inulin prod product which is if you look at what happens when you put it into a system that has a microbiota of a western population it goes very quickly we've gone back and looked at it because we didn't see changes compared to the chickpea and it's not fermented at all in the actual bi microbiota from the children who are, are un, un, undernourished. It just sits there and looks at you, whereas the chickpea starch gets totally fermented. So thank you for listening. Have I no, no, rattled no. on so too much? We thought we would just take a couple of brief questions on anything from Gary and I, and then we'll go, we'll go into the proper science. Um, after that. Anybody got any burning questions? Because we're, we, we want to keep time at the end, so once you've heard all the talks, then we can all have a nice chit chat. Okay. So. One question there? You're very shy to put up your hand and then took it down. No. That's right. And we'd like to say that we were the first to show that we're, we're not really. So, so there, there are our colleagues that work. Where does Paul work? In Zambia. <coughs> who actually has shown there's a big difference between SAM and SAM overlaid with HIV. So again, it, it's a very different area to play in, really. So the two similar conditions, but very, very different phys physiology. Anything else? We, yeah, we'll have a, a yeah. Mudu, do you want to? Yeah. Do you want to introduce him? Well, Mudu is uh, <laughs> uh, 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 is working with us. We have a Gates Foundation product. This is going to be quite different. One of the challenges you have working. To, are you all right to find your presentation? Yeah, yeah. One of the challenges <coughs> that you have working in 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 any place is to understand what people eat. Okay, it's really difficult. And in, in many, many different areas, food is not divided equally uh, in families and understanding why certain members of the families might be more at risk than others is very, very difficult to do. So Mud is going <coughs> to present some really cool ways of actually trying to actually yeah. s solve this problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very Thank much, Gary. Yeah, uh, and, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Modu. I, I work for Gary. I'm a postdoc working for Gary. Uh, and what I plan on doing in the next 10 to 15 minutes is to take you through uh, an innovative approach that we are developing to uh, measure people's dietary intake, but uh, with relevance in low and middle income countries. Uh, so most of you would have come across uh, 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 data like this. Uh, uh, in the past, in the past decade, I mean, in the, uh, the global health uh, community has made significant progress in actually uh, reducing the global burden of undernutrition. But this reduction has been uh, very, very disproportionate, as you can see from this graph from the UNICEF. Uh, populations in poor countries, especially those in the low and middle income belt, uh, still have high prevalence of undernutrition. Uh, you can see Sub-Saharan Africa and Middle East, uh, Middle East and Southeast Asia got the highest, uh, and it all got uh, significant complications on their health and well-being. <coughs> so the etiology of undernutrition is rather, rather very complex. Uh, 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 loads of multitude of factors, as Karth mentioned in her presentation. I thought to have a play. Uh, so, for example, the gut function. The gut is absolutely important. So, poor gut, leaky gut, as Gary said, uh, is associated with malabsorption of nutrient, and also infectious diseases burden. Malaria is associated with uh, anemia and iron deficiency. Diarrhea also is associated with zinc deficiency. But at the top of the peak, it's suboptimal dietary intake. Uh, not not having enough nutrient intake or not not not, not having 
a good enough quality nutrient intake, which could be associated to either uh, extreme poverty, uh, seasonal food availability, or man-made. <coughs> so owing to the fact that dietary intake is really important, uh, it's got a very important play in, in undernutrition, <coughs> understanding dietary intake at the individual, household, or population level it's important in understanding the, 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 the contribution of dietary intake to undernutrition burden, but also for designing uh, intervention, targeted interventions and policies to improve nutritional health. But then there's a problem, uh, because at the moment we don't have any method accurate enough to, uh, to, to provide accurate measure of population dietary intake. Actually, the, uh, accurate dietary intake remains an enigma so traditional methods that we've got, 24 hours dietary recall, food frequency, food frequency questionnaire, and food records rely on respondents, uh, on respondents' memory to sort of like uh, uh, give uh, w the kind of food they've ate in the last 24 hours or, or the last six months or, 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 or the last year. And most of the time this is given, this is done through paper and pencil base, uh, administered by an interviewer. It's really tedious, expensive, and often doesn't uh, result in accurate dietary intake assessment. So, so researchers in high income settings like the UK have been working very hard to find a solution to it. And that gave rise to development of uh, computer and web-based uh, method of dietary intake, especially 24 hours dietary intake, uh, Intake 24, My Food 24, Oxford WebQ, ASA, which is the American version, the Global Diet, which is the European version, have all been uh, developed. So they've actually improved um, handling of data from a very tedious process to something that's really simple. People can actually uh, uh, put forward their dietary intake at the comfort of their houses. But again, again, uh, as you can see, this method also depends on self-report and it's also associated with misreporting error. And then you've got the mobile base or the mobile assisted method, uh, which uh, people use, respondents use mobile phones uh, to take images of their food before and after eating. And then those, mis mis those, those images are used to uh, estimate people's dietary intake. Uh, doing, that, doing that in a population such as in low and middle income countries require a lot of training. You need to train people to use the mobile phone to take good images of the food. And also, uh, it's, it could be a bit problematic for caregivers. Uh, uh, imagine a mother with four babies having to do her own uh, images and also images of the four different babies as well. So it's really, really complicated. The computer and web-based techniques uh, in, in low and middle income countries is absolutely difficult because you, uh, numeracy skills is very low, literacy skills is very low, and also access to computer and internet base, it's a problem as well. Therefore, development of methods uh, uh, that, that, that doesn't require user input, the so-called passive method uh, that relies on wearable cameras and sensors to take images of food and, and use those <coughs> images to provide automatic recognition of the food, Estimation of dietary intake, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's one way to overcome the problem of misreporting. Yeah? And it could be used in low and middle income countries because it doesn't require numeracy skills, it doesn't require uh, literacy skills, and also it doesn't require access to computer. And, and, and this approach is really, really simple because basically what happened, you just wear a wearable camera on yourself, and then the camera take uh, images of the food you eat, and then we use back-end software to estimate your food and nutrient intake. So currently, uh, uh, we are, we, we, uh, I mean, Guy, Kath, and, and myself, and a few people in the US, we've developed uh, a, a study in Ghana and, 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 and Kenya, whereby we are interested in uh, assessing people's dietary intake. And this is the conceptual framework of the study. We are using uh, camera devices to uh, to collect dietary information in household, and we want to collect all the way from the source of food to understand where people get their food from, the cooking techniques that they do, and, 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 and give wearable camera devices to each and individual member of the household to use during their intake. And these images are stored uh, in a cloud uh, storage device, and then we use uh, our softwares, a custom designed so softwares that we develop that could uh, provide an automatic recognition of the food, uh, estimation of the food volume and also nutrient estimation of the food. <coughs> 
So we, we've got this uh, device here. This is the food cam. So the food cam, basically what it does, it's a stationary camera. It sits on top of the, uh, of, of the kitchen area and take images of the food that's, that's been cooked. It takes, it, takes, it takes images every four or five seconds of, of the whole uh, cooking process. And we've got this device with the e -hat. It's uh, it's a it's a hard base with a small uh, micro camera uh, on the visor. So basically, it's 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 used to uh, monitor breastfeeding, to 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 record the frequency of breastfeeding, but also the duration of breastfeeding. And this is this is camera device. The e button. It sits it sits on the chest, uh, just in front of you, and you've got the plate in front of you, and it takes images of the food that you eat. Uh, and this one is the glass one device. Uh, it just sits on a glass. You have, you've got a small uh, micro camera over there. And then the ear one device as well. So, so what we've been doing uh, in the past six months is uh, to put these devices through a very rigorous process of testing to find, uh, to, to establish the functionality of the device, the performance of the device, and also acceptability of the device among study participants. Uh, so we, we, we conducted the first study here in London, and, and that study is, 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 uh, is looking at user perception and also to identify and solve uh, uh, challenges with the technology, but also to validate the device against weight food record. And then we've got study two plan in, in, in Kenya and, 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 and Ghana, whereby we'll assess the acceptability and performance of the device in households in those places. Uh, this, will, this will help us also uh, identify challenges with the devices, but also uh, test the ability of the devices to collect uh, dietary intake uh, in the households. And then we've got the validation study also uh, in Kenya and, and, and Ghana. So we'll validate the devices against 24 hours dietary recall and weight food record in 88 households. Uh, so the first, just to give you a brief down of the first study that we did in, in, in London here, we recruited 18 volunteers of Ghanaian Kenyan origin. Uh, uh, we, we divide the participants into, eight, uh, into uh, three groups, six per group, and then invited them to the clinical research facility at Hammersmith. And, 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 and then at each visit, we provided Ghana, Ghanaian and Kenyan food. And the devices were tested in unique low and middle income country setting scenario, uh, especially uh, <coughs> testing the devices under good lightning, under poor lightning, also communal eating, which is shared plate, like having more than uh, one uh, people eating from a plate of food. And the outcome of, of interest for this small pilot study is acceptability of the devices among the participants, but also the quality of the image capture in both good and, and poor lightning. Uh, and, and then we send the images to an independent assessor to uh, assess the image quality from each of the devices. And then staff at the clinic uh, made observation with the placement of the devices and the ergonomics. So as you can see from, these are some of the images we collected uh, with, with the wearable camera devices. So the image quality from, from all the devices are very, very good. Uh, they give very good uh, clear image of the food. Uh, based on this image, uh, someone could easily know what, uh, what, what, what food has been eaten and, and could make dietary assessment from this image. So these images could be fed into an image annotation software uh, that provides uh, uh, assessment of the dietary intake in real time. So, so in this case, you don't, you don't really need to ask the res respondent, what have you eaten yesterday, what quantity of food you eat, because the proof of the pudding is right there in front of you. And, and, and we all know in low and middle income countries, uh, like in Africa, electricity is quite challenging. Not many people got electricity, so how about if we have to use the device in a household where there is no electricity? Uh, we try to sort of like work around that. So uh, at the CRF at Hammersmith, we sort of like switch the light off and then, and then ask the participant to eat in the dark. And these are some of the images we've got. Uh, but we were able to uh, develop a software that could sort of like strip the darkness uh, uh, out of the image and sort of like bring the food to light and then we'll be able to do annotation of the image. Uh, so with regards to acceptability of the device, uh, all the devices are highly acceptable. They've got, they, they all have an acceptability rating of uh, uh, more than three, uh, actually 3.5 on average. So 
basically at the end of the at the end of the at the end of using the device we ask the participant to rate the devices from one to five on the ease of use the convenience whether they would like to use the device again and also how much does the device interfere with their uh, with their eating uh, so e button which is which is the uh, the big button that sits on the chest uh, seems to be uh, uh, the high, highly preferred device among among the participants. Sixty-seven percent of our participants prefer to use the e-button device compared to the others. And again, I did say we send the images to an independent assessor to look at the images to tell us uh, the quality of the image. Uh, how how is the clarity of the image? Are you able to see the full plate before eating? Full plate at the end of the eating, and also to sort of like track the progression of the eating. So the ear one device uh, that sits that sort of like a Bluetooth uh, ear one device uh, performed very well in that. It's got a better quality compared to all the other devices. So e button, which everybody lo everybody loved, but it, it doesn't really have a very good image quality. So based on the preliminary findings, we are able to sort of like make some decisions. Uh, we know e button is the participant's primary choice of device. Uh, the ear one device has the best quality, but it's not very popular. Uh, and then the glass one device uh, performs second best, but it's been very, very stable in all aspects. So we, we made decisions such as to adapt the glass one device as it is, but to merge the e-button and the, and, and, uh, and the ear one device into a new improved devices. <coughs> and currently we are recruiting families in London uh, to test the device in household. Uh, the whole purpose is to test the device uh, is to use the device in, in monitoring people's food preparation, but also measurement of dietary intake in, 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 in children between 0 to 18 years. Uh, those breastfeeding, we use a different device for them, spoon-fed kids and also kids that are able to feed themselves, and as well as uh, shared plate eating. So uh, just to conclude, uh, I would like to say an objective and passive assessment of dietary intake uh, remains uh, very, very exciting and it's a, it's, it's, it's a possible solution uh, around the problem we've got with uh, dietary misreporting. And, and, and the camera and sensor-based device are highly acceptable among participants. And uh, currently we've tested our devices in four households in London and, 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 and there's, there's been no problem so far. Uh, and the in this initial study that we did will provide a good framework to, to sort of like uh, 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 support the deployment of the devices in, in Ghana and Kenya. All right, just to thank a few people that's been that's participated in the study. It's, it's, it's a multi-center uh, study, lots of uh, collaborators were in it, but uh, these are all the people that helped with the study and we've got funding from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you so much. Yeah, so the camera the camera run run by itself. So basically we just give it to you, switch it on and then and then off it goes. And it's got really like strong battery. You can it, it can go the whole day. Yeah. yeah. Uh yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 The food cam. Yeah. 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 Like, where would you be able to put that in some, let's say, hot and hot? Yeah. 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 And yeah. also, um, this is not a quick question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 sorry, okay. So, logistics yeah. as well, because. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, the, to answer your question about privacy, which is really important, the software has been designed yeah. to take anything out that isn't a food image, so the engineers behind this have been really, really clever. That, so, anything that doesn't have a food image in it is taken out. So that, and it's taken out before the images get packed up, up onto the cloud. So, so, so that it's not really a big issue, because it, it's a really important question. Yeah. 
Yeah, we'll have loads of time to discuss yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. 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 Right. Okay. Yeah. right, so yeah. we're going to move on to something different now. So Douglas has travelled all the way down from, from, from Glasgow. He's obviously been sitting on the plane for far too long. Yeah. Um, uh, D D Douglas and I have worked together for far too long hmm. now um, on various pro pro projects, but the one you'll hear today is a little bit different about trying to investigate the gut barrier. So, Thanks, Gary. Um, I heard somebody mention the B word. I hope the next time I come to London I don't need my passport uh, after, <laughs> after next week. Um, anything could happen. Um, so I'm, I'm, I might be a little bit controversial. Um, we like to think that the gut's important, but do we actually know if the gut's important? Um, and, and maybe what we'll challenge ourselves to think about is what we know and maybe what we don't know uh, in terms of the gut function in uh, conditions of undernutrition. Um, I come from a kind of tools background. I'm interested in measuring things, um, which is probably why we have a strong collaboration. Um, it's such an important thing is to be able to measure function. We've all seen this, we all know this. Um, this is looking at undernutrition and overnutrition. Um, as countries develop, they move from the undernutrition aspects to the overnutrition aspects and obesity being the problem. And perversely in some, where Gary's mentioned already, the double burden of uh, malnutrition, where you see malnutrition and obesity in the same settings. Um, so this maybe is my first controversial slide. Um, when I say undernutrition and overnutrition converge in the gut, because actually lots of the things we're interested in in undernutrition, we're actually also interested in measuring in overnutrition. Um, nutrient supply, inflammation is really important, as we've touched on already, particularly in SAM. Permeability. A lot of interest in permeability and overnutrition as there is an, un an undernutrition, as that driver, that underlying driver for the inflammatory process. A lot of interest in the gut microbiome. Um, a lot of heat, a lot of light, well, maybe controversial in the, in the obesity um, sector at least. Um, infection clearly is important in the undernutrition setting, maybe less so in the overnutrition setting. Maybe homeostatic signaling is more important in the overnutrition setting, but still is something we need to understand in the undernutrition setting. Micronutrients are important. And the gut is critical to these functions, the, the processing of that food, that dietary input, and how it impacts on the host is determined by the gut. But the outcomes are different. In obesity and non-communicals, in the overnutrition aspects, but in the undernutrition, we're looking at a whole range of different conditions, hunger, wasting, <laughs> Underweight. Data mentioned stunting, um, which we haven't touched upon yet, but actually stunting is the big challenge in the undernutrition uh, world, where there are many children who suffer from stunted growth, which has impacts for both the child and also for economies as they go forward. And part of one of the, the sustainable development goals for uh, the WHO is how do we challenge, how do we overcome that stunted growth? Now, our the challenges of undernutrition in stunting and the challenges of undernutrition in severe acute malnutrition completely different. Where do they merge? Well, possibly the gut is an important organ within this, this syndrome. Um, we've kind of tried to conceptualise what it is and we're trying to study. And this is in uh, stunting put together uh, in a review just a couple of years ago trying to understand what, what is it that we're trying to pick apart here. We've got enteric infections. We've got social and environmental factors. Sanitation, important. And we've got nutrient intake that's been touched upon already. Converging at gut function. And I'll touch upon in the next few slides what do I mean by gut function. Clearly the gut microbiome, genetic and epigenetic factors are important. And these lead to outcomes, particularly growth, cognitive development, and the vaccine response. And often we don't comment on the vaccine response, but that is important in developing countries. So what do we want to know about gut function? Well, is it gut function or gut dysfunction that we're trying to measure? What is a normal gut? And I challenge, and maybe we can have part of the discussion about this, is what really is a normal gut? I don't actually think we know what a normal gut is. 
We certainly know functionally what it can do, but I don't think yet we have the tools to be able to characterise that. And these are the aspects we're interested in. Mucosal injury, the microbiome, inflammation, nutrient requirements, which I'll touch on in a little bit, and permeability, which has been mentioned already. So I want to, just for the rest of this short talk, look at maybe a little bit of the evidence and maybe challenge some of our understanding of this and propose where do we go next. Um, this is work from Paul Kelly's group in Zambia who's doing some really nice work um, on biopsies and of course one of the challenges here particularly in children is how do we measure these things about the gut that we're interested in. It's awfully difficult. Um, once you go past the stomach, it's very difficult to measure uh, directly. And this is work done on uh, endoscopy and biopsies uh, from uh, Zambia. And this is a cartoon where they're characterizing this, this syndrome. I'm going to call it a syndrome because I don't actually think we know what it is yet. Environmental enteric dysfunction. Started off as tropical enteropathy. Um, it's now EED. Um, it's characterized by this flattening of the villi in the intestine. And that has consequences for the gut. It has consequences for the ability to digest nutrients, the integrity of the gut, uh, as has been demonstrated. And it's thought to be highly prevalent in areas of poor sanitation. How prevalent is difficult to know because actually the gold standard for measurement is the biopsy. And that's clearly not possible on a population basis. It's acquired in childhood, but it's poorly defined. This lack of a case definition really dogs the field, I feel. We don't have a marker that says that's a case and that's not a case. And that's a real issue. And I think what gives us a lot of hope is there is evidence that it's reversible. That if you move children out of an environment of poor sanitation and undernutrition into uh, areas where there's better sanitation, more nutrient availability, that this enteropathy uh, is, is uh, reversible, uh, this dysfunction is reversible, an improvement in the, the villi structure and the function of the gut. So the question is, what can we do? Now, clearly, we're not going to move all of the children out of these conditions in Africa and these situations in Southeast Asia. So what can we do to improve the gut? Now, this is where it starts to fall apart a little bit, particularly in EED is our lack of a case definition. And actually, Gary's touched a little bit on this uh, sugar permeability test, the LM test. Um, it's been around for 30 years, maybe more. We're still using 30-year-old technology to measure something that is meant to be critical to the function of the gut. And this is work from uh, two studies. This is the Mali-D cohorts uh, that have looked at uh, percent mannitol, percent lactulose on the LM ratio and expressed it as a standard deviation Z score versus a reference population. And what you see is actually there are changes with age and some of these populations differ uh, in terms of particularly the percent lactulose. So for example, the Indian population uh, seems to be more permeable. But actually there's no clear definition, there's no clear uh, description or, or, or uh, difference between these populations in terms of their uh, permeability, their gut permeability. If you look at, this is a review done by Den a number of years ago, looking at LM in, in EED and stunted populations, and the results are contradictory. There's no clear uh, evidence that LM is reporting in terms of growth outcomes. And that's a real challenge for us in the use of this test. The, the relationship between the permeability as, as measured by this test and growth outcomes is often poor. So that leaves us in a difficult position, I feel. Is permeability really that important? In SAM, I think the evidence is clearer, where the gut barrier is falling apart. In growth outcomes, hmm, I don't think we have clear evidence yet that permeability is the big driver for that impairment of growth. And that leaves us with an uncomfortable position is it the test that's the problem? Or is it the fact that gut permeability is a movable feast? Or is it that gut permeability is not really that important in growth outcomes? 
I think what is clear evidence is inflammation. Um, we've seen already inflammation is an important part of the, the SAM condition. But in growth outcomes, there's emerging evidence, and I call it emerging evidence, that inflammation puts a pressure on the growth plate. So here's uh, data from Andy Pendergast's group looking at uh, infant IGF-1 and birth weight. And you can see quite a nice linear relationship. And also maternal inflammation versus uh, child infant inflammation, suggesting that inflammation is putting pressure on the growth plate. Looked at a range of different outcomes, and you can see clearly an inverse relationship between some of these inflammatory markers and IGF-1. And that's suggesting that inflammation is playing a critical role in growth, but we don't fully understand yet how, and that's the challenge we have. This is, uh, again, the MALI-D cohorts. Um, one of the disappointing things is that we have a lack of correlations between uh, many of these markers. So this is a series of gut inflammation markers, poorly correlated, and that leaves us again in a comfortable position. They should be telling us the same thing. When put together as a score, we can see it puts pressure on growth. So an indication inflammation plays a role. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and this, for me, challenges um, what, what, what are we trying to measure. Biomarkers are really very useful, but what are they telling us? If we take LM as the gold standard, you can see actually the level of correlation is very poor for a lot of these biomarkers. So is it LM that's the problem? Or is it the biomarkers that we're measuring? Are we measuring the wrong things? And this was a group in, uh, in Pakistan where there was little responses was nested inside a, a, an intervention. Poor response to many of these biomarkers, which is a real problem. Is the biomarker the problem? Are we measuring the wrong thing? What came out of this, though, the gut permeability seemed to be associated with growth. But inconsistent, this is the challenge. The measurements we're doing are not consistent across different cohorts. So I suppose where, where do kind of my background fit into this? Can we measure uh, things differently? Can we measure other attributes of gut function? So we have the mucosal atrophy, the villus atrophy, the inflammatory response, and if we look at other conditions, we can see whether there are improvements in villus atrophy. We get improvements in the function of the gut. And here, this is all data, a measurement of disaccharides, rush, rush border enzyme activity. And here it's uh, sucrase. So the enzyme in the gut that's responsible for sucrose digestion. Um, I'm linking that to um, some old data in, from Australia. Now, it's, it's quite neat data, um, but it's limited in terms of our technology. And this is using stable isotopes <coughs> and exploiting the difference between the isotopic signatures in sugar that's derived from maize and sugar that's derived from beet. It's a slightly different isotopic signature. But we can measure that. And this is work that was done in children of uh, Aboriginal descent with diarrhea controls on non-Aboriginal children. And we can see a difference in response in terms of the sucrose digestion. And this is measured by a breath outcome, breath CO2. And that's quite nice when we start to think about field uh, deployment, how we're going to measure things in populations in LMICs. And we started to take this a little bit further um, in a project that's funded by the IAEA, where we're going to uh, adapt this test. One of the challenges with the sucrose breath test, as it's constituted there, in exploiting the natural abundance, you need a lot of, of sucrose. So this is 20 grams. That's not really going to be an, ish, uh, 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 an acceptable test to take to the field in children. But we can exploit the fact that we can get highly stable isotope labelled uh, sucrose off the shelf. And the consequence of that is it gives us extra sensitivity in the test. And uh, here we're developing, and we haven't got data from the field yet, we're doing the validation work at the present time. Um, we're about to go into do some field studies. But we've now got a test where we can use 25 milligrams 
or less of the sucrose, not 20 grams. And that gets us into the domain of being able to use this in children. Now, we're refining this test, and I, and I don't have data other than from healthy individuals, which is not relevant for, for this talk. Um, but we're going to try and refine that test down to something that could be as simple as a single or a two-point measurement of gut, brush border, enzyme activity. And we think that's correlated to the degree of villus atrophy. Now, why this is useful, I think, and important is that it's not a, like a biomarkers, which might be a qualitative test. This is potentially a quantitative test because it tells us something about the degree of damage to the gut. And I think that's relevant to both stunting and to severe acute malnutrition, where we might be able to grade the degree of damage that's done at the level of gut function. But it's measuring an important point as well. It's measuring the function of the gut. It's measuring what it's doing, rather than simply is it intact or not intact. Because the function is important to the nutritional outcomes that we've been uh, talking about or hearing about. So this is kind of the wish list. This is where we want to get to. Um, what do we want to measure? Well, in mucosal injury, we want to measure digestion and absorption. And that's an area that's really been largely neglected in this space. We sort of think we give the nutrients. We expect that they're going to be digested. We expect they're going to be absorbed. But do we actually know that? We don't. There are some emerging data from certainly Paul's group on the morphology of the gut, and we can see that there are changes to the morphology of the gut. How can we measure that more non-invasively? Because we're not going to be able to biopsy masses of children. Mucus is an important barrier in the gut. How do we measure mucus production? <laughs> Cell turnover and intestinal blood flow. Two important things to measure, but challenging to measure. Microbiome, much more mature. Composition, uh, assessment of pathogen burden. Function, mm, challenging. I don't think we're there yet. Host response. Some of the technology here is very pertinent to that, the deep phenotyping. Inflammation, I think quite mature, but are we measuring the right biomarkers? Nutrient requirements. I haven't really touched on nutrient requirements, and that's a really interesting topic. Um, we have recommendations for protein, for example, for these children, but actually do we know that's sufficient? Particularly for children sitting in a background of a pathogen burden. And there is some data, not a lot of data, but there is some data that there's an increased requirement for protein, particularly some essential amino acids. But we need more evidence in that, and some of the work that's going on in hunger is trying to address that. <coughs> We've heard about the microbiome. We haven't really touched on micronutrients, uh, but still an important part. Permeability. We, we've, we've focused a lot on LM in this field, but I mean, I'm happy to be challenged by anybody. Um, in the room, but are we really satisfied that LM is the appropriate test for permeability? Is it telling us what we need to know about the gut? Is it telling us about where the lesion in the gut is? Is it telling us about the size of that lesion in the gut? Because actually what we're interested in is translocation of antigens across the gut, endotoxins across the gut, and ultimately bacteria across the gut. Does lactulose represent an LPS molecule? Does it represent a bacterium? Clearly not. But it's dead convenient to measure LM. And we carry on doing it. So the challenge is, can we do better? And I'm just going to finish with a slide just to stimulate maybe a bit of discussion as to where we go next. Um, nutrient requirements. Stabilized ops play a really important role in nutrient requirements. So assessing protein requirements, but also the digestibility. We tend to look at elemental amino acids, but actually the function of the gut is to digest complex molecules like proteins. Do we know that that gut is competent to digest these proteins? We don't. Energy balance, body composition, and breastfeeding, important uh, tools uh, which stabilize to play an important role. We've got the omics that tell us about the microbiome and the host response. I think we're making some progress here, but it's slow. And um, there's some work going on here in Imperial looking at um, spectroscopy based tools that allow characterization of the size of the lesion in the gut. And I think that's got great promise. But it's early days yet. Mucosal injury, injury, we're looking at digestion and absorption. I think we've got the tools, 
to be able to measure that, we now need to do the studies. Mucus production, epithelial turnover, a bit more challenging, still possible. Gut morphology, I think, is quite mature in some groups. There's some good data emerging, but it's not going to be, particularly from the invasive techniques, widespread. We've got tools to measure blood flow. I've touched upon the omics tools. Maybe function, we don't yet have the tools to understand microbial function. We can measure surrogate markers, like Gary mentioned, the short-chain fatty acids, but they're quite crude in terms of understanding the function at any phylogenetic level. So more or better tools to measure function would be helpful, and phenotyping techniques. And I think we'll still have a large reliance on biomarkers for our uh, inflammatory markers. So my last slide, um, where next? What was common to already in the audience, there is some work in this space, looking at function or uh, improving function in the gut. Limited effects, improved intestinal permeability. That was one outcome from Minari's work. This is some work in Ethiopia where the improved protein quality, and that's important, not just the quantity, but the quality of the protein was associated with better growth outcomes, suggesting that if we get the right quality and uh, type of protein into the gut and get the gut working, then potentially we can supply the amino acids for growth. This was some work done in uh, Malawi looking at uh, replacing enzyme replacement therapy with modest effects, but again, some improvement in gut function. So the challenge I think we've got is, if we improve gut function, can we expect the clinical outcomes to follow? And that's the challenge we have. We are a little bit hamstrung because we don't yet have the tools to measure the gut function that we want to in the detail to understand if these improvements are having an impact on the gut. I'll finish there. Just to mention hunger. One quick question for dinner, says John. Do you want to get up, John, and turn to the side? Any burning questions? One up there. The evidence really supports permeability and inflammation. So are, are, are these inextricably linked? Probably. Um, if you get an improvement in permeability, would you expect an improvement in inflammation and a reduction in bacterial translocation, etc.? I don't think we're back there. Certainly in stunting, I don't think we're back there with the evidence yet. Because we don't really have a good markers to be able to say there are these <coughs> significant improvements in gut function. So save your questions. Douglas? Well, a great pleasure to introduce John, again, someone we've worked with for a long time. John's a very newly appointed reader now and does very complicated things as far as uh, molecules go and uh, very complex platforms, which hopefully you'll see why they're really important in this field. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Gary. Yeah, so I'm just going to give a kind of very brief overview of some of the work we're doing applying... Um, metabolic phenotyping or metabolic profiling or metabolomics, metabolomics. Um, this technique, how we apply it to malnutrition to understand the sort of metabolic or biochemical effects of malnutrition <coughs> and how this can contribute or lead to developmental outcomes and health and disease. So I think this has been well covered now, this kind of interaction between malnutrition and infections and leading to gut damage, further exacerbating malnutrition. Um, most of our research is probably from a chronic undernutrition point of view and how this, this sort of this cycle, how if it's there in over the first few years of life can lead to growth shortfalls and things like cognitive impairment and impaired vaccine responses. And what we're interested in is applying metabolic phenotyping at each of these kind of stages to try and understand metabolically what's happening. And so to do this, we apply this, this technique of metabolomics, which is what we call a systems biology technique. So the kind of old-fashioned, or, or maybe I shouldn't say that, but the uh, <laughs> one way of approaching a biological question is to um, look at the literature and formulate a hypothesis. So based upon 
what you know, you formulate a hypothesis and measure a small number of metabolites or variables, so maybe one or two, one or two metabolites. And this is, this is good and it's been effective, but you're very much limited by what you already know, what's already out there. And so what we try to do with metabolic phenotyping is we try to measure lots of the metabolites. In fact, the idea is we measure all the metabolites we can see. And so once you can look at lots of metabolites in, say, urine, blood, feces, or saliva, or tissue samples, <clears throat> if you can measure a lot of metabolites, you can start to ask very open-ended questions. So if you take urine samples from children that are malnourished, urine samples from children that are nourished, and compare them, you can start to see which metabolites change. And from there, you can start to understand which pathways change. And so this can very much hypothesis generation. It can identify pathways that might need to be supplemented with interventions. Another sort of benefit or key aspect of metabolic profiling is not only do we pick up metabolites that come from kind of host endogenous metabolism, so that that's encoded in the genome, we also pick up metabolites that come from the environment. So we pick up metabolites that come from the diet, and so we can understand sort of nutritional intake, but also how that nutrition is being processed. And we can also pick up metabolites that come from the gut microbiota. So again, we do get a measure of functionality of the microbes. And we can also pick up metabolites that come from pathogens as well. And then layered on top of that, we also see metabolites that come from interactions between these different kind of components. So we start to really get a top-down overview of this, what we refer to as the global metabolic system. And so we've applied this to a number of studies. Um, I'll try to keep the biochemistry light, there's only a little bit. Um, and so this example is in children from northeastern Brazil. And all the metabolites you see listed here, these are significantly associated with, um, so these are urine metabolites significantly associated with measures of growth. So we've got height for age, weight for age, weight for height, Z scores. Uh, we also have change in height for age, Z score um, over six months. So kind of reflecting catch up growth. Uh, and essentially, Anything that's shown in green is excreted in higher amounts by children that grew well. Anything that's shown in red is excreted in higher amounts by children that didn't grow well or the stunted children. And uh, one thing we consistently see is that children that grow well excrete higher amounts of betaine and dimethylglycine, or this DMG. And so betaine you can get directly from the diet, but it also it's a metabolite of choline, which is a, a key nutrient. And what this suggests is that children that are growing well are getting more choline and betaine from the diet. And choline and betaine are important methyl donors. And in particular, betaine gives up a methyl group to drive this homocysteine methionine pathway, converting betaine to dimethylglycine. The fact that children that grow well are excreting higher amounts of these suggests they've got more betaine driving this pathway. In addition, in Peru, um, and also in Bangladesh and Pakistan, we again see the same thing. Children that grow well, sweet higher amounts of betaine dimethylglycine. And so this is probably because, again, less choline from the diet. They also, we think there's mal uh, malabsorption occurring, so they're absorbing less from the gut. And we've also got evidence that the microbiota in the malnourished state metabolizes more choline as well. So again, pulling or reducing the bioavailability for the host. And this is important because if you don't have as much choline, you can't drive this pathway and you can't generate this metabolite called S-adenosylmethionine. S-adenosylmethionine, or SAM, is the body's primary methylating agent. It gives methyl groups. And this is important for DNA methylation. So these methyl groups are used to tag genes, and as they tag genes, they, suppress, or they turn off their expression. And so this is an epigenetic process, and it's really important early in life. And what this does is it tunes the genome to match it to the environment. And so it's very important early in life, it's important for development, but it's heavily dependent upon this availability of SAM. Uh, and so there's lots of work now going to try and supplement this pathway to, to try and improve uh, developmental and growth outcomes. I think, um, I think legumes might be rich in betaine, actually. Um, also, it's been shown to be, I don't know if you can see this here, but... Um, DNA methylation in the brain occurs really rapidly in the first two years of life and has a big impact on brain function. Something else we see is we see a change in nicotinamide metabolism with growth. And so we all know that NAD plus is really important for energy metabolism. 
uh, particularly in sort of the first nine months of life, energy is really needed to drive growth, really important in early life. Um, and so you need a lot of NAD to be available. It's also consumed by things like sirtuins, PARP, um, these enzymes are involved in things like DNA repair. As they use the NAD though, they consume it. So your body has to constantly replenish this pool of NAD plus. And it does this, the majority comes from tryptophan, about 90% comes from tryptophan metabolism. Um, and the rest is sort of supplemented from either converting nicotinamide back to NAD. Um, you can also get nicotinamide from the diet. Nicotinic acid as well comes from the diet. This can get converted to NAD+. Also nicotinamide riboside comes from, from breast milk. This all helps to kind of maintain this NAD+. Pool. What we see is that um, children, so here if we're looking at the wasted children and also the children that, that have a, a drop in, uh, in growth, excrete higher amounts of N-methyl nicotinic acid, which kind of counterintuitively, this is a biomarker for nicotinic acid deficiency. So children that don't grow well have a deficiency in nicotinic acid. Whereas children that grow well or have catch-up growth excrete higher amounts of N-methyl nicotinamide. This is a methylated form of nicotinamide. And the idea here is if you have a surplus of NAD+, then you have a surplus of nicotinamide. In order to excrete that, then you methylate it and excrete it N-methyl nicotinamide. So this is a marker of an abundance of NAD+. That's what we think anyway. So children that grow well have an abundance of nicotinamide, NAD+ whereas children that don't have a depletion of, of nicotinic acid. And so again, there are studies underway to try and supplement this pathway. We also, um, there's work going on looking at using, um, uh, looking at pathogen abundance in feces using something called TAC card. We can profile a whole range of, of pathogens uh, and these are metabolic associate, urinary metabolic associations with different pathogens. What you see is different pathogens change host biochemistry in different ways. They all have their own signature, and so this is something we're exploring as well. And then we see quite consistently that stunted children, uh, malnourished children, have a different microbiome functionality. And so all these, these metabolites here are excreted in higher amounts by stunted children, and these largely come from protein breakdown by the microbiome. And so the microbiome in the malnourished state tends to be more proteolytic. It metabolizes more amino acids, and, produce, and so the products of these are, are the, these metabolites. And as a result, they're not producing short-chain fatty acids that Gary spoke about earlier. And so in case anyone's not familiar with the microbiome, um, we sort of now know our body is colonized inside and out by a huge array of Microorganisms, current estimates, there's around 37 trillion microbial cells in and on the body. The best study of these are the bacteria. And important to remember that each <laughs> bacterial cell in and on your body brings with it an accompanying genome. These genomes, are sort of different bacteria, bring with them different genomes, which contain different genes. So when you think about all this mass of genetic information together, what we collectively refer to as the metagenome, it's been estimated there's around 3 million different bacterial genes in the metagenome. Um, and when you compare this to the host genome, which has around 24,000 genes, you can see there's anywhere from 100 to 150 times more genetic information in the metagenome than the human genome. And a lot of these can encode um, enzymes which form metabolic functions. Uh, and so as a result, it helps to diversify the metabolic flexibility of the host. So it allows us to digest a whole array of different nutritional inputs. Uh, and differences in the microbiome result in this different sort of uh, ability to digest uh, inputs and also changes what the host sees from these nutritional inputs. And so I think as, as Douglas said, uh, as Gary said, um, a lot of work showing that in the malnourished state, so you, you start acquiring your microbiome from birth um, and a lot of factors sort of shape how it matures but it's been shown that if you're undernourished or malnourished, then your microbiome is a lot more immature. That, that development is restricted. And we also see that the functionality of the microbiome is also restricted. It's rest uh, restricted to sort of very simple, um, early kind of functions. Uh, this was a paper out last year again. So the, the bulk of your bacteria uh, are largely in the, um, in the colon, in the large intestine. And it's thought that this is probably due to immune system, but also substrate availability. And 
what we see here is that stunted children, you get this sort of loss of control and you start to get decarpartmentalization of the microbiome. You start to get small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And one of the uh, factors we think that drives this is a change in substrate availability. So again, this is work. Paul Kelly's getting a lot of uh, name checks for there, isn't he? Um, so Paul Kelly does a lot of work in Zambia. He's based at Blizzard Institute. Um, this work we did with Paul uh, looking in Zambian adults. He collected aspirate samples from the duodenum. And um, this is measured by NMR. So they're looking at uh, metabolites by NMR. And these are correlations with this measure, IFABP, or intestinal fatty acid binding protein. And this is a measure of gut damage. The idea is um, gut cells produce intestinal fatty acid binding protein. And when they're damaged, they release this into the plasma. And so if it goes up in the plasma, it's <coughs> indicative of gut damage. Anything pointing up and with color here is positively correlated with gut damage. So what we see when you damage the gut, you get higher amounts of choline, methionine, all these other amino acids in the gut lumen. So it's showing you get gut damage, you get mal